Hey, this is Sule Urbina, and tune in to The Relay for the latest news in boxing all around the world. Thank you for supporting myself and other female boxers. We truly appreciate it. Welcome to the motherfucking Relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this per tweet from Michael Benson. Bob Arum has said, Vasil Lomachenko could face Richard Comey on December 11th, but also claimed that Devin Haney is in the mix as a possible opponent for Loma next. Haney is currently a network free agent. And, you know, a lot of people aren't buying this, Devin Haney included. Devin Haney took to social media and characterized Bob Arum's statements as cap. He's not buying it. He doesn't take Bob Arum's statements seriously, and in truth, neither do I. Listen, Devin Haney is one of the most well-paid lightweights in the lightweight division, and... If Bob Arum had all these versions, all these issues with paying Sean Portier to fight Terence Crawford, what issues would he have paying Devin Haney to fight the solo Menchenko? Richard Comey is the cheaper and more viable alternative. Speaking of Richard Comey, Devin Haney reached out to Richard Comey's promoter, Lou DiBellia, by way of Twitter, and he said, We reached out to you about a fight with Richard Comey. You said you would call us back. What happened? You guys haven't received an official offer from Loma, so let's make it happen. To which Richard Comey said, You're the champ. Get your people to make us an offer if you really want it. How are they supposed to do that if your promoter doesn't pick up the phone? Devin Haney says he called your guy and he hasn't gotten back to him. Devin Haney replied to Richard Comey's comment by saying, You and your problem trying to use me to start a bidding war between me and Loma. You said you wanted to fight. Where is that energy? And essentially what Devin Haney is saying here is that Lou DeBellia and the Richard Comey people, Richard Comey, what they're trying to do is leverage one situation against the other so that they can thereby take the best offer. That if the Loma people see that Richard is in the running for a Devin Haney fight, the Loma people might offer him up more cash. Devin Haney people see this, they might then offer Richard more cash. Devin doesn't think Richard's serious about the fight. And I can't call it, it's really more he said, she said at 135 pounds. That's what's happening, but what's not happening, at least not for Devin, are fights. You know, his name gets tacked on to Joseph Diaz, but then Joseph Diaz's name gets tacked on to Ryan Gersha. Meanwhile, Richard Comey expresses an interest, but it seems to be a fleeting interest because he's also in the running for a Lomachenko fight. It's the same fucking thing from always. I can only tell you what I think. And if you want to know what I think, and you're here, so I'll assume that you do, I think that the people over there at top rank will view Richard Comey as a more viable option for Vasil Lomachenko because it's a cheaper alternative to Devin Haney. Devin Haney made something like $3 million fighting little old Jorge Linares. So what's he going to want up front for a Lomachenko fight? And whatever that number is, do you think that's a number? The top rank is willing to give him? Be reasonable. Be serious. Richard Comey is the cheaper alternative, and that's likely the option they are going to go with. They're not going to want to foot the bill for a Devin Haney fight. Comes to Jojo Diaz and Ryan Gersha. Well... I think that a lot of people, Joseph Diaz included, view Ryan Gersha as being more beatable than Devin Haney. I mean, I don't think Devin Haney's perfect. He certainly was hurt, visibly hurt, wobbled by Jorge Linares in his last outing, and that's all well and good. But Ryan Garcia was dropped by a non-puncher and Luke Campbell, who was beaten by Jorge Linares. So, I mean, pick your poison. Diaz versus Garcia is an in-house fight. It would be for Golden Boy Promotions. And I don't view that as much of an issue since Golden Boy fighters and Matchroom fighters both fight on the same platform. But people over there at Golden Boy, they might figure to themselves, well, why send JoJo over there to lose to Devin when he can lose right here to Ryan? Or vice versa. Listen, they have to be very careful with Ryan Garcia. They can't just match him against anybody. I mean, where do you think this aversion to facing Devin Haney comes from? Listen, given the financial value associated with Devin Haney fight. The fact that Matchroom would pay through the nose to do it and the DAZN platform is actually behind that fight. They want it. Given the financial value associated with that fight, don't you think that if the Ryan Garcia people viewed Devin as being as beatable as a Francisco Fonseca or a Romero Duno or even a Luke Campbell, don't you think they would have had it? You'd make more money fighting Devin than fighting those guys. If you view him as being beatable, very beatable, as beatable as the guys you've already beaten before. It'd be a no-brainer if you viewed him as being beatable. But you don't. You view him as risky. And listen, I don't think that either Devin Haney or Ryan Garcia are the finished product. I don't think that either of those guys 
have reached their full potential. I don't. I think Devin has flaws that he needs to patch up the same way I think that about Ryan. But I do think the Ryan Gersha people view Devin as a bigger risk than he's worth and they'd rather fight someone else. Someone where they have more leverage in the situation and perhaps it's not as risky. More than happy to make Devin against Jojo Diaz. Um, but if not, we need one of those top guys at 135 because sooner or later, you know, we've got to make our move with Devin Haney in terms of the big fights. And that might even mean moving into 140. You know, is that a fight with Mikey Garcia or Regis Progre? You know, we're in talks for that fight. I, I, I love Devin against those guys as well. But he's ready. He's ready to fight all those guys. All that being said, I'm actually in agreement with Eddie Hearn. And I've been saying it for a while. Devin might need to just abandon ship at 135 pounds and move up to 140 and start his campaign up there to become a world champion. Those titles are set to go vacant very soon. And you want to be around when that happens before they all get snatched up. In other news, per a tweet from Steve Kim, more insights into what led to the collapse of Canelo Alvarez versus Caleb Plant's undisputed super middleweight title fight. In regards to Canelo versus Plant, the clause involving Canelo facing someone else for $40 million in case that Plant got injured for September 18th, the replacement foe had to be agreed upon by both sides. If not, Canelo was free to walk away, but he couldn't just face anybody. And you may need to read that twice to wrap your mind around it. In the event that something would have happened to Caleb Plant, Canelo Alvarez would have needed Caleb Plant's team's approval. What? To fight someone else. He would have needed their approval? I mean, it's right there in plain English. The replacement foe had to be agreed upon by both sides. Why would Canelo leave that in Caleb Plant's hand? I don't understand. Why would Canelo Alvarez's substitute opponent in the event that something would have happened to Caleb, why would Caleb's team have to sign off? Why would they have any say-so in the matter? And why would the people over there at PBC and Fox think that these are agreeable terms to get Canelo Alvarez on board when this is precisely the reason that he parted ways with Golden Boy Promotions? Because he don't want nobody wagging their finger in his face telling him what's what, who he's going to fight, and for how much? Did you guys forget? The people over there at Golden Boy Promotions, when they first entered into that deal with DAZN, they empowered them to make certain choices, certain decisions, in reference to Canelo Alvarez's opponents, even though that agreement was not in keeping with the already existing agreement Golden Boy had with Canelo, that he decides who he fights. He makes that decision. That whole bit about DAZN only approving premium opponents, that was a situation that came about because Golden Boy Promotions... They basically told the people at the zone they had a say. They had a say in who it is that Canelo Alvarez fights, even though based on Canelo's existing agreement with Golden Boy... It wasn't supposed to be up to anybody else. It was supposed to be up to him. And based on that, Canelo Alvarez sought his release from Golden Boy Promotions, and he achieved it. He was released from Golden Boy Promotions, and now he does what he wants when he wants on his terms. And it looks a lot like... What are these guys, morons? They thought that under any circumstances, any circumstances at all, Canelo Alvarez was going to stand there and let you try to dictate to him who he's going to fight if something happens to Caleb. Why would you think he'd be okay with that? Honest to God, I did a double take when I read this. I did. I did a double take because I couldn't believe what I was reading. I couldn't believe that the people over there at PBC and Fox could be so short-sighted. Why the fuck would you think Canelo would be okay with this? I know that in that situation, part of the clause was that he can always walk away. But better still, before it even comes to that, you want him to empower someone else. To need someone else's approval. In the event something happens to Caleb. Well, I'll tell you what. You wasted a lot of his time, you did, but you wasted some of your own. And you're still supposed to try and deliver the people over there at Fox, Bill Wanger, all suits. You're still supposed to deliver them five pay-per-views annually. Four to five. The dumb dullards on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook can call Canelo Alvarez a prima donna all they want. They can play the blame game until they're blue in the face. And you can too. But whoever he fights next, it's still going to do good business. It's still going to sell. He's still going to make eight figures. Caleb still won't. I mean, essentially what I'm getting at is... You can acknowledge what happened here, what led to this fight's collapse. You can either acknowledge it and see it for the folly that it is, or you can... Keep pushing your narrative. You can do that, too. There's no shortage of 
narrative and propaganda pushers in today's punditry. The best pugilistic world of boxing news. You can do whatever you want, but the fact still remains that a part of what led to this fight's collapse is that for some strange reason, people over there at PBC and Fox, they thought this was a good idea. They thought that Canelo Alvarez was going to go for this. That the replacement opponent would have to be agreed upon by both sides. Why the hell would Canelo need you to sign off on who he's going to be fighting? You can either can guarantee, guarantee him the 40 or you, you can't. Can. And what you're telling that guy is that the 40 he's supposed to be guaranteed for his troubles, for his time. That's contingent upon... What is? And Caleb's team signing off on it. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, Canelo can simply take his business back across the street, fight Dimitri Bivol or somebody else, make about eight figures. Caleb Plant, he can go back to fighting the Mike Lees and Farfandugans of the world. I'm hearing that Anthony Durrell wants to fight with him. Let's see if he can make eight figures fighting that guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's talk of a uh, IBF final eliminator between Evny Shevchenko and uh, Caleb Truax. Maybe Caleb Plant gets the winner of that fight. Oh, God, what if Caleb Truax wins? We'll get a sequel to a fight no one was all that entertained by to begin with. <laughs> Spin doctors and narrative pushers aside, the established order doesn't change because in the real world, the real one, not the digital one where you can find these talking heads in wet blankets, regardless of what you want to call Canelo Alvarez, he's got all the leverage because he's the marquee fighter. You either do what you've got to do to get a fight with him or you don't. And if for whatever reason, any reason at all, PBC and Fox's proposal to Canelo wasn't to Canelo's liking. Cross the street, Caleb. What do you got, a curfew or something? You can't cross the street by yourself? You're not allowed? I can't stress this enough. DAZN offered to do the fight, and on DAZN, the fight still represents a greater financial value to Caleb Plant as a boxer than anything he can do on Fox. Because without Canelo Alvarez, who are they going to have you fighting? Anthony Durrell? Caleb Truax for a second time? Hell, even a Benavidez fight. It won't get you the payday on Fox that Canelo can get you on the zone. If you don't cross the street. To get that career high price. To get that career high payday. There's only two reasons. There's only two ways it breaks down. Either you don't want it bad enough to cross the street, or your bosses, your bosses, they won't let you. Because they'd have to be your bosses if they have that much power over you. Another news per tweet from Michael Benson. Noya Inoue versus Nonito Daenerys rematch unification is a good possibility for November or December in Japan. Bob Arum has revealed. Daenerys promoter Richard Schaefer confirmed they want this fight, but explained it may depend on Japan's COVID situation. That and what else might be happening at the time, because we all know that Gennady Golovkin plans on having a unification match of his own with Ryota Murata on the 28th of December, late December, late this year. I don't think they'd stage both of those super fights within that close proximity to each other. Maybe November for the drama in Saitama 2 is a more realistic proposition, and it is all contingent on Japan's ability to get a fix on the COVID situation over there. They've got plenty of time to do it. We're in August now. That leaves September, October, yeah. and November. Perhaps they'll have a handle on it by then. If you're still telling yourselves that the donairs were being prima donnas in all of this, if you still don't see how it is that Sean Gibbons and John Real Casamero royally screwed the pooch. You can believe what you like. You can believe whatever you want for now. But it'll all come full circle once you see that John Real Casamero, he ain't got that many options, even if he does beat Guillermo Rigondeau. What then? What's he gonna do after that? Who's he gonna fight? Are they gonna let him cross over to top rank to face the winner of the drama in Saitama 2? Not likely. Think about it. Think about what's going on. Think about what we just talked about. They won't let Caleb Plant cross over to the zone to fight the face of boxing in this country. So what are the odds that they'd let one of their other champions at a lower weight cross over for the winner of Drama in Saitama 2? You know, you can take to your little social media accounts and hype up John Riel Casemiro to your heart's delight. You can do that as much as you want to. If you have a YouTube channel, you can make all the content you want in reference to the subject and try to pull blinders over everyone's eyes as far as... How fucked John Real Casamero? You have no idea. What do you think? That all the money there is to be made for a bantamweight, a bantamweight, is here in the West? Can Sean Gibbons and Al Heyman and all those guys get John Real Casamero a fight of equal to or greater than value than either the Donaire or Inui fights would have been? 
or would be. Can they do that? Because we all know how much Americans love bantamweights, right? Right. He's got potential opponents and paydays up the wazoo. You guys haven't thought this through, have you? You haven't sat down and thought on it yet that, you know, this is not a division that relies on an American audience to bring money to it. And the biggest and best fight for any bantamweight who's a champion or otherwise is a Naoyaino fight, or rather, the winner of the drama in Saitama 2, the Naoya Inoue versus Donito Denaire rematch. I mean, it's not hard to see why this Casemiro situation was so easy for the Donaires to walk away from, even though they were the ones making the fight possible and they were ready to foot the bill for the Vada testing. And rather than approaching that situation with grace, care, and, and courtesy, the Casemiro people, they shat it. <laughs> Casemiro beats Rigo, what does he do after that? Clout chase the winner of Inui versus Donaire 2 with no intention of actually crossing the street to face them? Till Casemiro himself is eventually fed to some super bantamweight at 122 pounds. Stefan Fulton, maybe? Because I don't think that John Riel's gonna leave the island. I don't think he's gonna face the winner of the drama in Saitama 2. I think he'll probably vacate that WBO title at some point, move up in weight. Possibly. If and when he does, Stefan Fulton will be there. Uh, I think Stefan Fulton is going to beat Brandon Figueroa in a matter of weeks. Uh, I think he'll be a unified champion in the super bantamweight division. But what I don't think is that he's going to cross over to the zone to face MJ Akhmadaliev. I don't see that happening. What I do see happening, possibly, is John Riel moving up in weight to challenge Stefan Fulton. And... <laughs> I don't think that's going to go well for him. Isn't that the plan we saw put in action when it came to Ray Vargas? You know, when he signed to the PBC, he was a champion. He ends up vacating his uh, super bantamweight WBC title. Doesn't actually have a fight on the banner. I think he's been inactive for something like two years. And, you know, earlier this year, we heard that he was made the mandatory for Gary Russell Jr. At 126 pounds at featherweight. That's what I think they're going to do to Casemiro. In case you haven't figured this out, the PBC don't send their belt holders to other sides of the street. I'll try and find a way to keep that WBO title in-house. Before they let some guy on some other side of the street win it from John Riel Casemiro, they'll find a way to keep that title in-house, move John Riel up, and have him lose to one of their other guys. It might be a while before that happens. But that is what I see happening. That's a genuine possibility because... The PBC won't let Caleb Plant cross over for Canelo, so why would they let John Riel cross over for Naoya Inoue? They wouldn't. They'll coax him and coach him to name drop Naoya Inoue in interviews, all the while planning to feed him to a naturally bigger fighter, one weight class above his. That's what I'm expecting to see. That's what I think is going to happen.